Hey y'all, it's Sarah, the social social worker, and thanks for tuning in for another episode of Discussions with the Social Social Worker. Today's guest is Xander Kegg. Xander is an award-winning social worker who's received the 2020 National Social Worker of the Year and 2018 California Social Worker of the Year. Xander is a public speaker, sought after workshop facilitator, and a trans community organizer. Xander was instrumental in establishing and developing the Navy Medicine West Regional Transgender Care Team in July of 2016 and managed a caseload of 225 active duty service members navigating a gender transition while stationed on military bases across Asia, the Pacific Islands, and the Western United States. Xander is the co-editor for the following titles. The 2011 Lambda Literary Transgender Nonfiction Finalist, Letters for My Brothers, Transitional Wisdom in Retrospect. The 2015 Lambda Literary Transgender Nonfiction Nominee, Manning Up, Transsexual Men on Finding Brotherhood, Family, and Themselves. And the 2016 Manifest, Transitional Wisdom on Male Privilege. Xander is a contributing author of Adult Transgender Care, an interdisciplinary approach for training mental health professionals, and is the introduction author of You and Your Gender Identity, A Guide to Discovery. Xander is also featured in the 2014 award-winning illustrated documentary, Xanderology which goes beyond telling people that it gets better and humorously explains how one person changed their life in almost every way possible. Please welcome Xander Kegg, LCSW, and the 2020 NASW Social Worker of the Year. Hey y'all, it's Sarah, the Social Social Worker. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today our guest is Xander Kegg, an award-winning social worker, author, and public speaker. Thank you so much for being here today, Xander. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me, Sarah. Yeah. So Xander, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. Okay. So I was born and raised in Los Angeles County out in California. I currently live in Orlando, Florida with my wife, Margaret. We just celebrated our 18th anniversary a couple weeks ago. Let's see. Um, so I'm, you know, I might have somewhat of of a common or even unusual, depends on a people's perspective, route to how I got into social work. Because, you know, just when I talk about my history, it's, you know, growing up in Los Angeles, my family is um, Mexican. My, myself and my cousins were all first generation born in the United States. My father and all of my uncles served in the U.S. military. Um, some of my cousins have also served in the U.S. military, so I'm a Coast Guard veteran. But between the time of when I was born and when I went into the military at age 20, um, lots and lots of um, ups and downs in my life. I had, I contracted encephalitis at age six that led me into a coma and I was paralyzed for a couple of years. It also gave me some, you know, brain damage as a result. And um, I got tracked into special education, uh, which, you know, was, was not a lot of fun. Um, in the Torrance Unified School District where I was growing up. And so I was frustrated with that experience. So I dropped out of high school. Um, I had gone from, I had been in three high schools. And uh, that's because I went from public high school to a group home setting where I was going to school at a private little school just for us in the group home. And then I went to what's called a continuation high school, which is like where the bad kids get sent. Um, and then I dropped out of high school when I was 17 years old. But in the interim between dropping out at 17 and joining the Coast Guard at 20, I sort of bounced around. I moved over to Salt Lake City for a little while and, you know, I was getting into trouble, up to no good, shenanigans, not treating my body very well, drinking. Um, and so, you know, joining the military has really got, got me I wouldn't say back because I never really was on the straight and narrow path, but it got me on to some sort of path that was going to take me forward rather than, you know, send me off in some side, sideways venture, adventure. 
Um, I'm 54 year old, years old now, so there's been a lot of years between when I went into the Coast Guard. So I've done a lot of different things. I was a massage therapist. I worked in natural foods. I was in law enforcement for a while. So I've done a lot of different things. I finally did go to college when I was 30, and uh, that was out in Denver, Colorado. And then I went to graduate school um, three times. So I have three master's degrees. Uh, one is in conflict analysis and resolution. One is in theology. And then finally the MSW in clinical social work from San Diego State University. I graduated from my MSW in 2012 and I went straight into work at the Department of Veterans Affairs and then Department of Defense. And now I am a cultural competency and conflict management uh, a senior consultant or trainer with all things diverse uh, out of Jacksonville, Florida, and I'm working at a VA up in the state of Georgia doing those trainings. But I also do peer consultation work with therapists who have transgender clients. And um, I do transition coaching for adult transgender men. Um, I left out, I should probably fill in like, I'm a trans man myself. So um, maybe at this point, we're gonna have people have a little bit of cognitive dissonance <laughs> because they've been seeing me and hearing me. Um, and so, so yes, I'm a trans man. So when I was 39 years old, I started medical transition. And so it's been a little over 15 years now. Um, so I'm very involved in transgender community and a lot of work on, on with that community and on behalf of that community. Awesome. So many wonderful things have you shared with us just now, and I'm excited to dive a little bit more into it. Um, first off, uh, congratulations, you're 2020 NASW Social Worker of the Year and 2018 Social Worker Thank of the you. Year for California NASW chapter. What did winning that award mean to you and to your platform, um, especially being somebody who dropped out of high school and then made a bunch of different transitions and now you're receiving all this recognition well you know it's it it's the kind of recognition that when it when it came initially so even before that i got a san francisco cares social worker of the year so it was like the city of san francisco not the government but an organization within san francisco and it was sort of like oh wow like there are people in the community who are recognizing that what I'm doing and what I was doing is I was working with veterans, right? I'm a veteran. I was working with veterans. I was also doing stuff with, um, with individuals. Um, I was working with the homeless program at the VA, but I was also, and I'm still part of a, um, a San Francisco based homeless, um, nonprofit. So, so homelessness was kind of what I was doing, but, but there was a special emphasis in both of my jobs with working with uh, LGBT veterans and specifically transgender. So, so somebody was saying, you know, people were saying, oh, look at what this social worker is doing. And I thought, well, that's good. It's not only good for me, but it's good for the community, right? It's good for the transgender community. It's good for the veteran community. And it was through that process that I was nominated for the NASW California Award. So, you know, you have to be a member of NASW to get the award. You also have to be a member of NASW to nominate somebody. So it was from within my colleagues, right, my, my peers. And, um, and then I was selected and it was just another, I don't know, it was, it was unexpected because, it, I mean, think about it, I graduated in 2012. That award came in 2018. I had been a social worker for six years. I had been licensed for three years, right? So it was unexpected, but um, just a really humbling experience because again, here was a larger, right? Not just a city and county of San Francisco. Now here was the state of California saying, we see you, we see what you're doing, and we, we value what you're doing, and we value how you're doing it, right? So it was just a... It was just another confirmation of like, keep doing what you're doing, keep doing what you're doing. Um, by the time I got the California award in 2018, I had been working for the uh, Navy Medicine West transgender care team for two years at that point. And so I was, you know, a part of why I was nominated is because I was doing that work with the Navy, with the active duty sailors and Marines who were going through gender transition with command approval. And then the 2020, the way it works is when you win a state award, you automatically get sent up to the national office. And so they're basically looking at 
I think it's either 50 or 100, right? I think, because I think it's every other year. So they're looking at all of the people who were nominated at the state level, and that's how they're making a decision is looking at the state winners. And so that was, when I got that call in February of 2020, I think I asked the person to repeat herself at least three or four times. I sat down because I was like, wait a minute, what? Because, right, I got the California award in 2018. So when 2019 went by, I thought, well, I was in the running, but I didn't get selected. I didn't know that they do, did the award every other year. So I was, I was just blown away. I think that's the best way to describe that, that sensation, that feeling when that call first came in. Um, but being recognized on the national level, again, as a trans person, like a trans man who's a social worker doing work in the community on a voluntary basis, doing work in whatever workplace I'm in where I happen to have transgender clients or patients, and then going out and doing, you know, talks and, and trainings, like, it's just another way of saying, like, how far we've come that the National Association for Social Workers is giving the first time to, a, to an out, right, trans person for doing trans work. Like, to me, that is, um, that is a huge indicator of how far we've come. There's still things to work on, obviously, but th this as a national association recognizing trans people doing trans work is phenomenal. I'm very, very happy that the NASW um, has that capacity, right? They have that vision. So thank you to the NASW. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. And, and thank you for all that you've done. And you're, you're just so inspiring and your charisma and your energy is so infectious. And it makes me <laughs> want to like continue to like push forward and to, to really advocate for what I think is important. So thank you for sharing all Absolutely. Of I think it's great. To have Absolutely. I whole I I wholly wholeheartedly support and endorse people getting passionate and going out and doing good work. So that's 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 the thing I love about social work is we have we get paid to do that. <laughs> yes, yes, that's exactly. We get paid to do that. That's great. So let's talk a little bit about um you working with the trans community um and your experience working um on the VA handbook. Uh, for the transgender employee transi transition guidance. I mean, that's really big. That's like a, a milestone, um, especially for the military. So can you talk a little bit about that experience? Absolutely. So I'll separate it. It was for the VA, so for not DOD, just to kind of separate the Veterans Health Administration or Veterans Department of Veterans Affairs versus Department of Defense, just for people not to get confused, because it doesn't apply to DOD at all, military personnel or civilian employees in the DOD. It's only for Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, so when I was a VA social worker, I, um, I got involved in, I was appointed, is the, the language, to two national work groups at the VA central office. One was LGBT veteran patient care services, and one was LGBT employees through the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. So on both ends, on both sides, we were working on reviewing policy, revising policy, um, on generating ideas to, uh, of things we could do, trainings, outreach, marketing, you know, web design, all these kinds of um, issues. And so one of the things that I, um, I asked about when I was asking you know, to be on this national, when they were pointing me to the National Office of Diversity and Inclusion group, I, um, I said, you know what, I, one of the things I'd really like to do is I'd like to spearhead a process or a project to have transition guidance drafted for transgender employees at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Because, you know, the federal government is the largest employer in the United States and the personnel office, so to speak, for the federal government is OPM or Office of Personnel Management. And you can go onto the OPM website and it has a lot of information about transgender people who are employees of the federal government. And it's, but it's general information. It's not agency specific, right? So I thought it would be good to have agency specific guidance. Where, where does somebody like me, if I had, I didn't do this, but if I did start my transition while I was at the VA, I had already done it, right, when I came in. So let's say, if I didn't, where would I, which department do I go to to get my email 
address changed, right? Because maybe I'm changing my name legally. Where do I go to get a new sign on my door, new business cards? Um, how do I notify the different departments and, and which departments do I notify? So we wrote up, it's one of the, it, it, it may still be the only guidance that is cabinet level wide, meaning, you know, there are, there are administrations within, there are agencies within the federal government and one entity may have a transition guideline, but not their overall admit, right agency. It might be just an administration within that agency. So for, this is for the Department of Veterans Affairs. So it applies to Veterans Health Administration, Veterans Benefits Administration, and Veterans um, Cemeteries, and, Cemeteries and Burials Administration, right? So any, any employee of the Department of Veterans Affairs who transitions on the job, this is a guidance for them. That is, that is so wonderful. I mean, having, having a resource that you can access in a time where you're having to also figure so much else out is great that to know that your employer is being supportive of your transition and i think that's wonderful so thank you for spearheading that absolutely absolutely you know as a veteran who uses the va there's also a policy it's called a directive that's specifically for lgb veteran patients and transgender and intersex veteran patients so there's policy for 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 those of us who are also patients of the Veterans Health Administration, what the policy is, um, and the fact that we can get hormones and we can get counseling and we get we can get other services um, through the VA. We don't have to go outside for a lot of our services. And that's great. That's actually something I didn't even know about. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Oh yeah. You're welcome. And then, so do you want to talk a little bit about your? Um, when you were working with the Navy Medicine West Regional Transgender Care Team, what was that like for you? Oh, it was a great experience. You know, um, I had friends who were working in the DOD and it was sometime around the fall of 2015. I was starting to hear buzz that um, before, before um, President Obama left office, he was most likely going to approve open transgender service in the, in the armed forces. And so I started applying for jobs with military branches. I was living in um, California, so I applied mostly to Navy jobs. And as luck would have it, I ended up getting hired with the Navy. For anybody who knows the federal government process, I applied for the job in October of 2015. I interviewed in January 2016, and I started the last day of May 2016. That's about, <laughs> that's about how long it can take for, right? Because that was just one job. That's how long it takes. But then the great thing is 30 days after I started, the new policy went into effect. So on June 30th, 2016, open transgender service, the policy rolled out saying starting on October 1, with command approval, active duty service members were going to be able to do a gender transition while they were active duty. And so I, um, the commanding officer, she was interim at the time, she sent out an email to the whole command, which was Na uh, Naval Hospital San Diego or Naval Medical Center San Diego, where I was working as a case manager. She sent out an email saying, new policy, it's going into effect, we're going to figure it out, we're going to work on how to, you know, put it into practice. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to respond to that email. I responded directly back to the interim commanding officer, and I introduced myself to her, and I said, I'm trans, I'm a case manager, I'm a LCSW, I worked at the VA, I've done this on the VA side, worked with, you know, with the agency to get transgender care, um, you know, training, and so she was like, that's fantastic, she reached back to me within like 15 or 20 minutes, and invited me to the very first meeting, which was on July 15th, 2016, then there was a meeting again on maybe like the 22nd, and at that meeting, I was appointed by her to be the case manager on what was to become the Navy Medicine West Transgender Care Team. It did not exist, right? And so between mid-July and, let's say, um, to the end of November, I was part of a group of people that were working to establish and and build to develop what became the Navy Medicine West Transgender Care Team. And then starting on December 9th, 2016, until I left there, um, which was like right around the, um, 
technically the end of December, but I was still employed until like mid -J January 2019. Um, I was the clinical social work case manager overseeing the intake and orientation process um, and managing the database. There were about, there were 225 service members on my caseload when I left after three years of working for the team. So it was fantastic. I loved it. It's like a dream job. And the only reason I left was because I came out to Florida to be closer to family. My father has dementia now to, you know, help take care of him. And, uh, but the transgender care teams for the army and the Navy and the air force, they still exist. People are still going through gender transitions. Um, there's just new policy now, but, but there's all kinds of, um, of uh, l levels of people and how they can and can't, you know, go through the process these days. But it, the transgender care team at Navy Medicine West still exists. I turned it all over to some nurse case managers and they're running the show as far as patients, you know, dealing with patients uh, directly, so. Yeah. Wow, they are so lucky to have you, so lucky. And so many people, <laughs> you positively impacted 225 individuals. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. I mean, what, you know, part of the process was not only working with those individual um, sailors and Marines and Coasties, I got to work with, with members of the Coast Guards as well as, I was also interacting with their medical providers, right, on their ships, on their bases, right? Um, and for Navy Medicine West, it's a large region. I have pa I had patients in Japan, Okinawa, Singapore, all over the West Coast, Hawaii, other Pacific Islands, um, Oregon, Washington, Arizona, Colorado, Cup one or two out in Oklahoma at one point. So it's a broad, so it was their command, it was part of their command, it was their medical command, it was them, it was, you know, so it was a, it was, it wasn't just 225 service members, it was like all these people connected to them. Yeah. 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 Oh man. Well, it was great. I loved it. <laughs> oh, well, no wonder you won NASW Social Worker of the Year. That's great, all the work <laughs> that you're doing. And thank you so much. Um, you know, we've been talking um, about the trans community um, and the term transgender has been used several times. For people who are watching who aren't um, completely sure what that term means, can you kind of give a definition um, for our viewers and listeners? Absolutely. I'll say two things about that. One, technically speaking, trans means to cross over right? And gender, gender can be an identity, it can be an expression, it can be a role, but typically what it means is crossing over um, in your gender, maybe what people expect of you based on what your, your sex is that's on your birth certificate, right? Your original. So it means to cross, trans means to cross, um, to cross gender, gender roles, gender expectations, um, it can mean to transgress, it can mean to transcend, right? It can mean a bunch of different things. So I would say that it technically it means to cross gender, but everybody who uses it might be using it in a very individual way. Mm -hmm. um, some people might say transgender is like what they call an umbrella term, right? right. It's like an all encompassing. Um, but quite honestly, there's, there's, not, um, there's not full agreement in the trans community that okay. that is accurate or appropriate or all inclusive. So, so, there's some, so there's some debate about that within the community, but it is used in that way a lot versus like saying transsexual or transvestite or cross-dresser, right? Some people would say those are all categories of people under the transgender umbrella along with a bunch of other people like genderqueer, non-binary, gender diverse, gender fluid, these, right? There's a bunch of different identity labels so yeah. no i and thank you i think it's important especially um for myself i'm very green in the social work field and for other young social workers being able to educate yourself on the spectrum or the fluidity of gender and also um terms such as transgender or, or non-binary or gender non-conforming conforming things like that being able to understand um what you're clients identify or do not identify with is very important yeah well and clinically speaking right if we're if we're talking about being clinicians and we're working with you know with trans clients and patients we're going to be we may be called to do things like give somebody an official diagnosis in the medical record right the electronic medical record so that they can um 
so that they can access certain types of care. And so currently the DSM-5, um, the diagnosis is gender dysphoria. In DSM-4, it was gender identity disorder. So they, and now in, there's gonna be a DSM-5-TR coming out and it's going to be the diagnosis will be gender incongruence so it's oh, changing again yeah. but it's going to match it's going to match with um so dsm is going to be dsm 5 tr will be gender incongruence icd 11 which is not yet out but will be coming out is going to have gender incongruence and then uh wpath which is world professional association for transgender health yeah. Um, they they produce what are called the standards of care. Their eighth version, which is about to come out, it'll be coming out in 2021, will also say gender incongruence. So for the first time, all three of those standards, those guides, are going to have the same diagnosis. Um, and it's going to be shifting out of mental illness in ICD. It'll be going over to like sexual health in DSM. It's going to be going into other clinical concerns, right? So it's changing not just name, but it's changing category that it's falling under. Oh. So things are, it's coming. It's not yet happened, but this is what's coming soon. Yeah. 2021, most likely. Good, yeah. good. And I, I, yeah. I appreciate that it's all, um, across the board it's all the same diagnosis which is that's really yes. great so it'll be very helpful yes yes i hopefully when i become an lcsw it will be out and i can i can use it so yes. that will be great yes what has been your inspiration to becoming a social worker what you know with your background what led you to become Xander Keg LCSW. A <laughs> uh, couple of things. So I mentioned in my in my uh, little the, my mini introduction in the beginning that I was in a group home. Right. So I spent two and a half years in a group home for uh, quote delinquent girls, right? Because this is before transition. So I was a juvenile delinquent, and. Um, my diagnosis at the time was incorrigible, which nowadays would probably be oppositionally defiant. <laughs> so a rebel rouser for sure. But of course there were lots of social workers in that environment. And there was one in particular, her name was Chris. And she treated me like, I, I, I got sort of, if you could call it bully, bullied, you know, like when you have staff who kind of are rude and disrespectful respectful and push you around and name call right like it's a form of bullying but it's um she was the one person that um uh she saw me one day i was laying on the ground with about six or seven staff members holding me down while i was trying to kick and punch and and probably screaming profanities you know um clearly i had done something i don't remember what i did but i had done something and they were trying to restrain me right that's not an uncommon thing in that kind of environment and she walked by and she looked down at me and she said what are you doing and i i don't remember exactly what i said but i think it was something along the lines of you know i don't know i was just bored or you know i just like to i like to mess with people you know i i kind of did like to poke the bear a bit when i was younger and maybe even still a little bit. Um, and she told the people that were holding me down to let me go and told me to get up and to follow her. And um, that was it. Like she became, she became my case manager. She moved me from the home that I was in to one that she oversaw. And um, that sort of set me on a path, right? Um, that got me closer to what I was to become. I was still, you know, you know a little juvenile delinquent so to speak but i but i was i that got me out of it you know she protected me basically um from from that and then i went and you know i went you know years passed and i went into the military then i became um i went to to college and i started doing work as a case manager and it was while i was working in a case man as a case manager that i met a lot of social workers and noticed that social work case managers um did they had job duties that looked better than what I was doing, right? And um, they definitely got paid more. And I was working for the state of California. They went on furlough. I, I needed a different job. 
Um, and I made the decision, right, because I had already had master's degrees, theology, conflict resolution, not too practical. <laughs> um, yeah, whatever. Um, but but it was through the process to figure out, like, what am I going to do? And working with all these social work, with all these case managers, who some of them were social workers, I started looking into, oh, maybe I should become a therapist or me. I just looked into a bunch of different jobs and I landed on social work. I liked the code of ethics. Um, I liked the basic foundation of of how we see the world, the lens by which we see you know, like person in their environment working for oppressed, marginalized, and poor. Like I, I like the history. Um, and so that drew me in. Uh, the code of ethics drew me in to the profession. I think we have a great code of ethics, but you know, so not only are you a public speaker, an award winner, you also are an author and you've co-authored some publications as well. What have you learned in that process of writing and sharing your knowledge um, and experiences with others? Well, it's given, it's given me an opportunity to be part of groups of people, right? Like academics who are writing papers for journals, but it's also given me the opportunity to work with people in my own community, particularly trans men um, in editing anthologies. So, because, you know, there's a lot of anecdotal information out there. It's like, it's not so simple to say, oh, you want to transition? Well, go see a doctor and get hormones, right? Go see a therapist, get, you know, like, it's not that simple. Navigating a completely new reality um, it's helpful to have mentors. It's helpful to have some foundational information. Not everybody has access to a, a people, right? In their personal environment, not everybody, right? I'm also talking about, I started this before the internet was a thing, right? So my first book, Letters from My Brothers, when that came out in 2010, right? The internet was still in its infancy. And the concept was, I call it a paperback mentor. So that's really what motivated me was to say, you know, how can you win? Because people would come up to me when I facilitated support groups in San Francisco, people would ask questions. It was the same questions over and over and over again. And I thought, we need more information out there. Um, YouTube was not this huge thing as it is now, right? So all that was in its infancy. And I had gotten a lot of information through reading books um, and also through having a mentor, Jameson Green, um, who... Um, was connected to Lou Sullivan, who I believe we'll talk about in a second. Um, and Lou Sullivan, you know, I'll tell you a little bit more about him later, but it was it was through the, my connection with Jameson Green and learning about Lou Sullivan that got me on the path of, of making resources available in print, in print specifically. And I still do that. I'm still an avid supporter of print-based resources. Now, they may become Kindle books, but to me, that's still print. I you know, as far as the, the, the reading, you know, reading the words and getting a breadth, right? Getting a breadth of experiences. When you pick up letters from my brothers, transitional wisdom, you know, from trans men, it's like 15 different stories so that you can think for yourself, oh, well, how do I want to do it? Seems like there's not one way to do it. And it's like, absolutely, absolutely, right? So the academic papers are mostly about transgender veterans, accessing healthcare, which is something that a lot of people didn't know about. And so more people know about that now. Um, and so it's like these two avenues of advocating on behalf of transgender veterans as one, and then for trans men going through the transition uh, in that social way, you know, whether they're doing it medically or not, there's this social component to it. I also think that reading, there's something about reading an actual book or like feeling the paper that makes you feel so much more connected to a story versus kind of thumbing through it on a Kindle. But I, I, I'm so happy that you're providing information for people, whether they have internet access or not, you're giving them an outlet to really explore who they want to be and how they want to approach their transition. And I think that's, that's wonderful. So thank you. Yes, no, thank you. Um, you mentioned Lou Sullivan. So let's talk about him. Um, who was he? How has he like kind of inspired you? Um, and then I, I know that also you're the co-founder of the Lou Sullivan Society. So we can talk about that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Lewis Graydon Sullivan or Lou Sullivan um, was a trans man that founded an organization in San Francisco called FTM 
which became FTM International. Um, after he passed, he died of, um, of uh, AIDS-related um, causes. He was HIV positive. So he was from the Midwest, but he moved to San Francisco and, and founded this organization. And um, so he's responsible for a couple of things. One, he, he made it his life work to communicate via typewritten letters and newsletters with trans men all around the world, right? So that was, so Letters from My Brothers, my first book, was come straight from Lou Sullivan. The idea, he wrote letters to trans men around the world. He was a prolific writer. He published a book about a trans man that was living at the turn of the century. He published a newsletter, just amazing, um, amazing what he did. And he worked as a secretary actually at ARCO, which is, you know, like the gas and oil company. Um, so he, that was his job, was typing all the time. Um, so he was very good. He was very good at, at, at correspondence, at written correspondence. Um, so it was through Jameson Green that I learned about Lou Sullivan because uh, when I asked Jameson Green if he'd be my mentor, um, he agreed and he asked me to help him with some projects that he was working on um, with the archive materials for FTM International. He was the president of FTM International for 10 years, so he had all these archival materials in his house. And some of them, I think, were being moved over to the GLBT Historical Society, which is based in San Francisco. And Lou Sullivan is one of the founding members of that um, museum, so to speak. And so I was helping him, and I got to read correspondence between Lou Sullivan and other trans men. It was, it was just remarkable to be able to actually hold those letters in my hand and to right because Lou Sullivan you know, um, when he died, I think, which was 19, when was it, 1991, I think he might have been in his mid-30s, he was not that old, right, so, um, so he'd be much older than me now, um, so he was, he was doing his transition, he was on hormones, he had surgeries, you know, in the 80s, um, right, like a very different time period, and, and that, there are earlier, of course, but, you know, as far as my direct connection, um, to that. The Lou Sullivan Society was set up for two purposes. One, to keep the memory of Lou Sullivan alive, and the other was to, um, was to be a connection, a resource for trans, uh, for trans men, people on the FTM, female to males, kind of an older language, but that's how we identified it, spectrum, within the San Francisco Bay Area. So if, so if people were to go to the Lou Sullivan Society website, which is not like LouSullivanSociety.com or something, right, because it's some free website now, but it's, it's basically at this point, it's like an archive of uh, different resources in the Bay Area, information about Lou Sullivan, and some of the work that was done um, by the four of us who founded it. And uh, but so like we won a Vanguard Award by the Transgender Law Center um, back in the day. Um, I think it was founded. It was some maybe somewhere around 2007, I believe. Um, I had been on the FTM International Board of Directors, and then we we founded um, for the local San Francisco area the Lou Sullivan Society. So the so it, there's still information. You anybody can go and look up Lewis Graydon Sullivan and read all about him. Just very inspirational. He, he lobbied the American Psychological and Psychiatric Associations to stop stigmatizing trans people that were going female to male um, and the gender clinics at the time, like at Stanford and some other universities that had medical centers that had gender clinics. Um, he was denied access to going through a gender transition through the Stanford clinic because he was a gay trans man. So he was in relationships with men, and they basically were like, sorry, we don't make homosexuals, <laughs> right? So he started lobbying to get that to change, and you can just see the results of that. Like, he single-handedly did that um, in the 80s. So um, big kudos to Lou Sullivan. Um, yeah, he, he, he published this little pamphlet that he used to update regularly that told trans men where they could go to buy men's shoes for smaller feet, men's clothes for smaller frames, for differently shaped frames, um, all kinds of really interesting, like there was a whole section on when you go to the barber shop, this is the kind of haircut you can ask for because it's not the same as going to the salon, right? Like how to navigate a barber shop. It was very practical information. It was 
It was fantastic. And there's a guy in the Midwest, his name is Hudson, and he started a web page called FTM Guide, Hudson's FTM Guide. And he basically says, Lou Sullivan did this in paper form. I'm bringing it onto the internet. And now you can, he builds on that all the time. So it's kept up to date. And it's all the practical stuff for trans men who are transitioning. It's fantastic. That is wonderful. That is so great. And I, I love that it's like just having this way of sharing information and experiences and keeping the community connected, but also helping individuals grow and make decisions for themselves as an individual. And I, that's just, that's awesome. I Absolutely. Wish right. Yeah. And it's that pay it forward kind of, right? Lou yeah. Sullivan, he learned from people, you know, hey, you can start these groups. Like it wasn't the first group, right? There were other groups around the country of trans men that were meeting in their, in their living rooms, right? In church basements, right? So he had met other trans men that said start a group in San Francisco, right? So then he paid it forward and then like, and it just goes on and on, you know, from there. He directly impacted Jameson Green, who then was, is my mentor still 15 years later. And now the work I'm doing and sometimes Jameson and I collaborate. Yeah. So it's, Right. And Max Valerio, another mentor of mine, was a was mentored by Lou Sullivan. And so, right, and we've worked on projects together. So it's like this continuation. And now I mentor people, yeah. right? So we're just continuing the legacy of, of Lou Sullivan. And that and that's wonderful. You know, sometimes people will will start um whatever their their passion about whatever they're trying to advocate for but not all it doesn't always continue genera generation to generation so i think it's wonderful that you guys are in are pulling from like you say your ancestors or the elders and gifting it yes. to the the people the next generation coming up i think that's beautiful it's wonderful it makes me so happy <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yes. And you also have um, an illustrated documentary that is a, pretty much about your life called Xanderology. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Just briefly. So, so this, remember I mentioned earlier the organization that's in San Francisco that works with the uh, homeless. So it's called Welcome. Mm -hmm. And the executive director of Welcome is the uh, Dr. Reverend Rohr or Reverend Dr. Megan Rohr. Um, so Megan and I went to seminary together. So we've known each other since 2002. Um, and we've collaborated on a lot of different projects. Mm -hmm. uh, we co-edited Letters for My Brothers together. We also co-edited a book called Manifest. It's looking at... Um, the concept of male privilege from the trans male perspective. Um, you know, we, um, I serve on the board of directors for, for Megan's um, nonprofit, Welcome. And so one, Megan, through Welcome, the, um, they were working on a, um, I'm saying they because they prefer they and them pronouns. So they were, they were working on an oral history project and so they called me up and they said, hey, can I ask you some questions and record your answers? Because I want to use it as an example when I'm applying for grants to say, this is basically what I'm going to do. Here's an example. And then, I don't know, a few months went by, right? I said yes, and I answered a bunch of questions over the course of several days. And then I got a call one day or maybe even an email that said, hey, I took your, your oral, you know, the oral histories that I collected and I made a documentary, an illustrated documentary. So what they did is they took a white piece of paper and a sh black Sharpie and drew images and then took pictures with their iPhone and then converted it into what looks like a chalkboard with chalk, yeah. right? So, so the idea is, to, and in the background is me talking and then these illustrations um, that change, you know, with whatever I'm saying. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's probably like, I don't know, 20 something years of my life that were collected as an example. And we didn't go any further because it was just supposed to be a sample, mm -hmm. right? An example. Um, but then the illustrated documentary, Xanderology, it's like, it's like the study of Xander and really what it is, it's, it's the study of looking at how, how to go beyond um, expecting a better outcome in the future, right? So at the time when, when Megan was working on this, there was a very popular project. It was called something like um, It Gets Better. 
Okay. And it was very popular and people were recording videos about like, yeah, things were difficult in my childhood. Things were difficult in my adolescence, but it got better. Mm -hmm. And Xanderology, the way Megan, um, you know, uh, the way they captured it, the idea is it's more than just, it's going to get better. It's through, it's showing through my life how to make it better. Yes. Right. It's less passive right? It's more proactive. Don't just wait for things to get better. Just mm -hmm. make them better. Yep. And so that's what Xanderology is about. It's like, how did this like, you know, brain damaged, special ed, high school dropout. I didn't even mention I was in a gang when I was younger, right? Become a cop, right? And, and then a social worker. And you know what I mean? Like, how did that happen? Right? It didn't just happen to me. I was an active agent in that transformation. Yes. And uh, so, so that's Xanderology. And I think people can go to Amazon and either buy or rent just like a 10 minute version of it that's made the circuit around the um, film festivals all around the world. Nice. So. Well, I'll definitely be sure to put a link in it. And also on your website, there's a, a tab for film so they can, viewers and listeners can also view the work or like the link to it there as well. So Thank, Thank you. you for that. And well, Xanderology has a Facebook page. I don't, but, but Xanderology, Xanderology does. does. <laughs> yes, because it's about me, but it's not mine. I didn't produce it. Right. Um, I don't travel with it to film festivals. Um, I I don't there I don't get any royalties from it. Like it's it this is Megan's project. It just happens to feature me. So awesome. Uh, well, we'll, we'll make know. sure that the Facebook is linked too, so that more people can learn about Xanderology. And I've really enjoyed talking to you. And I feel like we could have like three more discussions on everything that we've <laughs> covered today. Um, but before we wrap up, I always like to ask um, our guests two questions. One, what are they taking away from today? And um, two, is what if one thing do you want our viewers and listeners to take away from today? Okay, so what am I taking away from yes. today? Um, well, just how much, how much social work is integrated into our lives, mm -hmm. right? It's like, I'm a social worker, you're a social worker, I've been doing it for a certain amount of time, you've been doing it for a certain amount of time, we connected, now social workers and others are going to watch this, like, the impact that social work and social workers have on society, like, I'm just thrilled about that, right, um, because most people know of social workers through, like, child protective or child welfare services. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm glad that people are getting a broader view of what social work is and what social workers do and who are social workers, right? Um, yeah, then the second thing, what I would hope other people to take away, um, and this is, I say this quite often whenever I'm talking to people, and that is this, um, if you meet a trans person, that's all you know about trans people, right? Like. The idea is, if you want to be an ally of the trans community, right. I say start with the trans people you know, right? Promote them, um, lift them up, connect people with them. Like, don't, don't take on the responsibility of becoming the expert. Let the trans person be the expert, right? Connect them with other people. Um, because the, the, the concerns that I have are that if you hear, if you talk to me, and you learn about my life, and you learn about the words that I use, and you learn about the trajectory that I've um, traveled in my transition, that's not necessarily, it's not like you can just take my experience and apply it to someone else. So if you're working in, in whatever setting you're working in, if you're working with transgender adults, kids, members of their family, it's, it's not going to be helpful to that patient or client to go, oh, well, but Xander said, and then apply it to that situation. What we need to do is we need to come at it from, it's, it's kind of paradoxical. We need to come at it from this place of, we need to be culturally competent and we become culturally competent by completing continuing education units, watching webinars, attending trans conferences that specifically have tracks for behavioral health. There's a whole bunch of them. Just put into a search engine in quotation marks, transgender conferences. You'll get some good lists. 
go to these places. A lot of them are available virtual right now. I just attended a two-day transgender medical conference virtually that was being put on in Fort Lauderdale. It was the 10th annual, so these are not new things. Um, so be getting culturally competent and um, it's in a sense embracing or even embracing the unknown, right? We have to be able to hold these two things becoming more culturally and linguistically competent and op being open for what we don't know. And that can be uncomfortable for people. People think, oh, I took trainings, I read books, I'm an expert, subject matter expert, and they'll put themselves out there. I've got one client, I'm an expert now. It's like, no, you're not. I'm not even an expert in so many regards, right? I know a lot more because I've, I've walked this path for 15 years. I've engaged with hundreds of people. I've done trainings for thousands of people, right? So clearly I've got more knowledge, but there's so much I don't know. So much, especially as time moves on. Younger generations, newer words, different communities, right? Depending on where you live in the country, the terms you use, the way you identify, the fluidity, the dynamics of that. You know, somebody might say, like, I used to say I was genderqueer, which would be like a non-binary identity, right? I said that. I was androgynous as a lesbian. I transitioned the first few years. I said, I'm genderqueer. And then I said I was FTM. And then I said I was a trans man. And then I started saying transsexual man. And now I just say man. Like, don't box us in, <laughs> right? Be open. It's that, it's that weird balance of getting some knowledge and yet maintaining an openness to what we don't know, what you don't know. Perfectly said. I think that if you hmm. approach a lot of things like that, being able to embrace the unknown, you're, you're setting yourself up to learn so much more about another person's experience. So I think that's wonderful advice. And I appreciate you taking your time today to be with us. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and thank you to everybody who is listening and watching uh, discussions with the social social worker thanks guys thank you so much sarah thanks y'all for tuning in and for listening to another episode of discussions with the social social worker to hear more episodes be sure to like and subscribe to all of our social media outlets have a wonderful day